Well, hello, Hollywood Time viewers. Today, joining us is Grammy-nominated ACM winner, legendary American country singer and songwriter, Lacey J. Dalton. Wow. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Well, that's a great way. That's a great way to start the interview. Thank you. I need all the blessing I can get, Judy. <laughs> oh, we were just talking about the humidity up here and the heat. And I know you guys are sweltering down there, but you know, we also have everything blooming up here. So I'll maybe sneezing during our interview. Sorry. Are you in Northern California? <laughs> no, we're uh, actually, I used to live in the Santa Cruz mountains for okay. many years. But I live up near the old town of Virginia City up in Nevada. I live up in the Virginia Range uh, Mountains, which are, you know, the Sierras are to the west. And uh, Reno sits down in a deep valley called the Truckee Meadows. And we're on a smaller mountain range to the east called the Virginia Range. And I'm about eight minutes from the old town of Virginia City. Wow. How long have you been up there? About 25 years. Oh, my goodness. It must be beautiful. It's really nice. I live up in the Pinion Forest, and uh, it's pretty scary around here now because, you know, the wildfires. The Pinion Pines have these little Pinion nuts on them. If you've ever had Pinion nuts, they're pine nuts. Oh, no. Pine nuts. Nuts. Oh, my dog has decided to join us, and he's Hi. heavily. Who's His that? name is Carl. He's Carl the dog. And Hi, Carl, Carl the dog. Carl the dog is uh, is has his own song. He's got his own book, and he even has his own video on YouTube. He ate Christmas one year, so we <laughs> recreated it, and uh, we did a um, we did a uh, book, and we did the we did the Carl the Christmas dog song. So if you have grandchildren or I children, do. do you? Uh, you should at Christmas time you should tune in to on YouTube to Carl Lacey J Dalton. Carl the dog or Carl the Christmas dog on YouTube and you'll get to see Carl and his antics and right now he's decided to be part of this interview. <laughs> Carl is small his head is about the size of a cement block. He's yeah. a half pit bull and uh, he's uh, he, jump up on mama's lap so we can see you Carl. <laughs> I, I, you don't want a 120 pound dog on your lap. I know. <laughs> he likes to be there but uh I think it might. Oh, we're talking about you. We're talking. Oh. About you. He's a big boy, but I, it's nice. I live up here uh, and I'm pretty much alone uh, on my ranch. And so I have all these dogs and I don't ever worry about anything up here. I don't worry. Uh, people up here have been robbed before and stuff, but I figure if they can get through three great big dogs and they're, they're welcome to whatever they can take <laughs> as long as they can get away with, you know, losing a limb or something. Today we're here to talk about, I understand there's a new acoustic version video coming out September 11th, which just happens to be the 40th anniversary of my all-time favorite song of yours, 16th Avenue. Come on, come on. Thank you. Oh, Thank I you. I love that song. Love you it. You know, I, people love that song. They'll still, still, I don't even know if they really know that it's about Music Row in Nashville. A lot of people will come up to me and say, do that song about 12th Street. <laughs> You know that song about 11th Avenue? Would you do that song? That's my favorite song. And I think that we discovered afterwards that people thought it was, if you lived in Chicago, they thought it was in Chicago. If you lived in New York, uh, they thought it was in New York. They thought it was in their town, wherever that was. Yeah. Well, it's such a universal story. You know, a kid falls in love with a guitar. He wants to be a star. He goes down to Nashville. You know, he sleeps in his car for a while. He might get a job as a fry cook or something. <laughs> and he begins to write. And if he's good and if he gets the right breaks, because there are a lot of people who are really, really good who simply don't get the breaks down there. Or if they do, they might write one or two or three songs and then they'll get a record deal and they'll get a big bus and they'll have a crew that has to carry that stuff around and a big band and they go out on the road and all of a sudden they're not having those hits and so they have to in my in my time which was in 1979 and 80 when I was signed um record companies really um they really helped young artists they helped you develop. They had people to tell you how to move on stage and, and how to do an interview. And you had um, uh, a lot of stuff like that going on. That's not happening anymore. 
if you right. don't happen first, well, they just don't have time. They're making too much money down there. Mm -hmm. You know, and the thing is, if you don't cut it after the second record, you go back to Indiana with this great big, I, they probably have to go bankrupt because the, oh. the tour bus alone, it costs more than most people make in 10 years, you know. I bet. <laughs> so how did that song come your way back back then? Well, I was fortunate. And I, I was talking to my friend, my friend, even Stevens, uh, wrote my last big hit on radio in 1992 called Black Coffee. He and his partner, Hillary Cantor. And I was talking to him the other day and I said, even, I said, do you remember how I got 16th Avenue? And he said, well, not exactly. And I said, well, you did it. Uh, <laughs> it be, I, it, he, uh, this guy was working in his studio, Evergreen Studios, as a carpenter. And his name was Tom Schuyler. And Tom played this song for Even Stevens, who was already making lots of money in the music business because he's an incredible writer. And um, even liked my voice, and he doesn't remember this, but he took the song to Billy Sherrill for me, who Billy Sherrill, who was the greatest producer in Nashville at that time ever. He had um, Cammy and George Jones and Charlie Rich and, and, and outlaws like David Allen Coe and, and, um, and uh, Johnny Paycheck. He did all kinds of people. But Tammy Wynette and George Jones were probably his biggest calling card, except for Ray Charles. And he was Ray Charles' producer almost to the end of his life. And I had been signed by Billy Sherrill, who was the most incredible producer I have ever worked with. He was the kindest, funniest, very, very smart man. And he was, he and even Stevens are the only two people I've ever known who could actually say when they heard a song for the first couple of times, that's good, that's a hit. That's a, and, and they would be right. A lot of people say that. I've said it and been wrong, <laughs> but, but, it, uh, but they weren't wrong. They usually knew. And so even took uh, the song that was written by Tom Schuyler uh, to Billy Sherrill and Billy played it for me. He said in his nasal wing, not a song for somebody. <laughs> and I said, well, it better be for me. I said, because it fits me perfectly. And so I got, and I'm so grateful to have been the person who got to sing that song. I really, it was such a blessing and it's been, it's been a blessing uh, all over the world and all, with all kinds of people. And, um, and I'm, and it's, they think of it as my signature song and I'm so proud. Uh, and people think I wrote it and I wish that I had. Um, I wrote a lot of my first hits. I wrote and co-wrote a lot of the the biggest songs that I had up until about that point. And uh, then I was on the road so much. I was on the road back then from 1979, 80, 81, and 82, and part of 83, over 300 days a year on the road, just out there grinding it out with a 10-piece band and a 10-piece crew and, and not even a monitor system which means you have to sing over the band. They have, everybody has a monitor system if they are able, because it's, that's the sound that you have on the stage that lets you hear what you're doing. So I was singing blind for about three years and we were working constantly. And I didn't write much after that because I was tired actually. So uh, it's so fun to be an independent artist now and to be able to write and actually have the time to write. And um, I'm really enjoying that part of being independent. Yeah. How's the, your company coming along? You have your own company too now, don't you? I do. I've had it for a long time. I have fun, a, yeah. a, a record company called Song Dog Records. I am the sole artist on Song Dog Records. <laughs> and, Good for you. Um, well, you know, you, you have to do it. It's a lot harder work, though, because you really have to fund everything. You know, you really have to find the funding. If you want to make a record, you have to uh, find the funding. And it's really, it's still pretty expensive to make, um, to do uh, quality recording. It doesn't have to be. I understand Gillian Welsh did her last, uh, so this may not be true, but my friend who is friends with her said she did her last album on a on an iPhone. I know that's what I'm hearing when they call them EPs though you know I I still like my you know I still like my CDs and my DVDs and my kids are like mom why do you always ask these people for their their CDs I said because I have a six CD player in my car and that's where I want it I don't <laughs> want it on my I don't have an iPhone I don't no I want I want it I like the jewel as I call it 
the jewel case. With the I have got to get you a copy of my independent CD, The Last Wild Place. That was a, oh. one I did in 2006. And I yeah. and it got in 2019, the Strictly Country uh, Magazine and the Spirit Awards judged it with this 13 year old record <laughs> at CD as the album of the year in 2019. And I was like, a complete surprise and uh and i was so grateful uh that i was noticing independent music that is um was uh, judged the best well-written song of 2019 by those guys it was a song called boundless skies which is on that cd and it was oh. such a surprise after 13 years you go oh someone noticed thank you thank lucky you. number 13 <laughs> yep yep well that's pretty cool well, congratulations yeah, been, on that. Well, it's been it's been great. It's been a little bit hard to get recognized in the, uh, independent music because, uh, and particularly at festivals and stuff. Oh, her, she's just some old country singer, so they don't know what I've done. But yeah. this year, I'm going back to Nashville, and I'm um, being awarded from the Josie Music Awards, which is the largest independent. Uh, uh, award show for independent artists they're giving me a lifetime achievement award for independent music and that's been a very hard you know when you get typecast as some old country singer it's pretty hard to you know make that leap into independent music but the Josie Awards this year and that uh, wonderful award for the Last Wild Place Anthology which I must send you I'll bet you don't have it nope I don't, it's and quite, I would love to have it. It's quite different than, it's quite different, but it does have your favorite song on it because in about 2013, I think I put a bunch of um, of the old, I redid all the uh, the biggest hits or the ones that I liked the best um, on that. That's why it's an anthology. Oh, great. Original, yeah, so there, it's on there too. So you can have 16th Avenue played in my studio with my players and uh, a wonderful producer from down where you are named Tom Bocci. Uh, Tom came up and worked in my studio with my ex-husband, who was a wonderful engineer. And uh, a lot of my, some of my band members have played with me for 30 years. So it was, uh, it's, it's a nice, I think it's the best work I've ever done, Judy. Oh, I can't wait. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, we'll send it to you. I'll have Leslie, uh, the greatest manager in the world, get your information and we can get that to you. All right. Way to go, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> what are the Jobs and Music Awards going to... Uh... They they are October 23rd. Oh, my gosh. And that it's is it there in Nashville? That's... It's at the Grand Ole Opry. And then oh. we'll, also be, <laughs> we'll also be playing um, at the Grand Ole Opry on the 21st. I get to do the 40th anniversary of 16th Avenue on the 23rd, on the 21st. Oh, and then my God. on the 22nd, we're over uh, at Rory Feek's place in uh, Homestead Hall in Columbia. And we're going to do an actual show there, a whole show. Which... At Roy? With Roy? Oh. Roy, yeah. 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 Do, you like, I, do you enjoy him? I follow him every day. Mm -hmm. Every day. Every day. My father, God bless you, Father. My dad passed away in January at 93. He loved oh. you. He used to call you a little Spitfire when he'd see you on family reunion. <laughs> he goes, Here's that Spitfire. I love her. Yeah, we love so, him. At what was your dad's name? Denver. Denver? What a Denver cool. Oh, Carlson. he must have been totally cool. I bet you miss him. Wow. Is yeah. he, um, do you feel him around him? Oh, I was with him when he passed. He passed in my arms and it, it's just, yes. I mean, he's with me. He's sitting right here, you know, he's always, uh, oh, it's just amazing. Every time I'd have- Oh, I got I'm chills. Hi, Denver. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He was just, he got me into country music my my whole life. And I've actually been a member of the Academy of Country Music. Uh, we just go to the award shows every year, especially back when they were at, do you remember when they were at Knott's Berry Farm? The, the very first- the I went to many ACM of them. award shows. We're back at the nuts in Knott's Berry yeah. Farm. It's a good time I, theater. I remember. I remember. It was fun. It was fun to be. I was actually the uh, roving vice president for that organization back in the beginning of my of my wow. days. Wow, that's so. It was so much fun, and then they moved it to uh, I think Universal, and then of course it went to to Vegas. And yeah, I use I go now every year as a seat filler. I fill in the seats for when you famous folks get up. What I do. <laughs> a seat filler. <laughs> you can be me. Yes. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Oh, I also wanted to talk to you about Willie Nelson and your the, and the, the half Nelson. Wanted to talk oh, about I'm so I was so thrilled with that. We have a, uh, we're working with a, a, a guy out in New York uh, with a record company out there called Red Giant. And he's recovering a lot of my copyright uh, stuff for me and just doing a lot of work like that. And through them, I was able to get um, uh, the uh, the platinum record that I had earned uh, as be being the sole woman on Willie Nelson's Half Nelson uh, CD and I was so proud of that because it had Ray Charles and Leon Russell and Neil Young and Carlos Santana and George Jones and Julio Iglesias and I mean it was really I was I mean I'm still proud of it I just hung it up on the wall the other day um, mm -hmm. we took some pictures with it which was harder to do than you think because the glass has a glare so we actually oh, had yeah. to somebody who knew what was do what they were doing because we were struggling and stuff but we wanted to have a picture out so you guys could see could see it it's really I'm so I'm I, I'm so proud of doing that not so much because you know uh, the song we did was wonderful it was called slow moving outlaw and it was a, a really nice duet about how we've taken the bounty of this country and she, one of the lines is, it's not that I blame them for taking her bounty, meaning the United States. I just wish that they'd taken her slow. Because where has a slow moving, once quick draw outlaw got to go? Yeah. And I just, I just loved the song. And it was so wonderful. Uh, my friend, um, Tom Metcalf from Texas, uh, showed me the song. He says, you need to do this song. He's an Indian. Uh, you need to do this song he said you need to do it with Willie and I said well I open shows for Willie but I can't just I don't feel like I could just walk up to him and ask him to do this song with me and he said don't worry about it and so he was uh Tom was very good friends with Willie's sister and he went to her and he showed her the song and Willie's sister showed it to Willie and Willie agreed to do it and it got to be on the half Nelson the uh. CD so it was it was a probably to me because of back then there was a bit of a glass ceiling you know people like dolly parton just plunged right through it you know they just broke yes. through that glass ceiling they used to say that girls couldn't draw women couldn't draw well that turned out to be you know completely erroneous but um at the time that i was there we really had to fight you know we had to fight even with really open-minded producers like billy Sherrill. We still, I had a deal with him. I won't put anything on the record that you hate if you don't put anything on the record that I hate. <laughs> that was our deal. <laughs> that was our deal. <laughs> but he was, uh, he said, uh, he told me at that time, he said, you're the hardest artist I have ever worked with to find songs for. <laughs> and I said, why do you think that? And he said, because you care about what you're singing. You can, you can listen to a hit and go, I know that's a big hit, but I don't want to sing it. And that happened. To me. That's happened to me many times. Many times. If I can't actually now, don't I don't won't say that I've never compromised on on filler songs on records because I've had yeah. to do that. But but um, the really important ones, um, I had to. I really had to believe in what they were saying um, because I, you know I think at the end of about three years on the road constantly. I was singing a lot of things that I had recorded that were part of that compromise and I wasn't feeling authentic and I I didn't know what was going on I didn't know who I was or where I was going and I went to hear Arlo Guthrie up in we were up in Massachusetts somewhere yes. it was Arlo's birthday and we were in this wonderful Victorian thing that was this stage that was built by the ocean and it had all this gingerbread. It was the most amazing. I'm sure it's been blown away by now because it was pretty rickety back then. But it was beautiful. Wow. It was almost like a dream. And I remember Arlo ended his show with Amazing Grace, but he didn't just sing the song. He told the story of the song. And he said, you know what? You know, this was what he told. I don't know if it's the true story or not, but it's what Arlo said. He said... There was a man who was uh, a slaver. He was, he was uh, the captain of a slaving ship, and those things were horrible. 
they were horrible conditions for the people horrible inhumane awful and he fell in love with a christian woman on the east coast up in the northeast and she changed him and he was so contrite that he wrote amazing grace and you can hear it in the song i don't care who sings that song yeah you know <laughs> amazing yeah. grace you know yeah you'd have to be like deaf to not be understand that song and feel it to the core and and even when you hear some little old lady singing it amazing grace you know even when you hear it like that the song has a spiritual feeling to it there are songs like that chris christopherson wrote a song called why me lord oh <laughs> and everybody everybody has sung that song everybody right. in the world has sung that song but nobody could ever sing it like chris christopherson exactly. because he was absolutely sincere and authentic and it gives me chills every time i hear it it's a song about gratitude yeah Lord, what have I ever done to deserve even one yeah. of the blessings? You know, it's a, uh, it's an amazing song, but amazing grace is like that. When songs come from spirit in, and they're that powerful, it, you can hear it and you can feel it. And those are the best songs to me. I mean, they're songs that are fun and about drinking and about, right. you know, whatever. <laughs> but those will last forever. Yeah, but the, yeah, they will. They They just don't wear out. Yeah. I'm hoping that uh, I'm writing some songs right now for a project called For the Black Sheep. And that is, uh, I introduce some of them. One of them I introduce so that if you've gone to a church or a synagogue or um, you've been, you know, uh, in a temple somewhere and you haven't found what you're looking for um, in with organized religion, I have a song for you. And I have a song that addresses that. And the first lines are, if that Jesus freak has turned you off and that CD TV preacher shut you down and your priest was inappropriate and something deep inside you simply came unwound, that's how it starts. And We're going to have an interview it, just about this. <laughs> well, it's uh, the, the la the, for the songs for the black sheep are songs for people who, are just have been turned off by dogma and they have thrown the baby in fact the next lines for the song are um yeah um, and uh, let's see um and your priest was inappropriate and something deep inside you simply came unwound and then that bible beaten zealot in the pulpit shriek repent or burn in hell well when you threw the holy water out you might have thrown the baby out as well mm. And the next line, the next line goes, when the pale and pasty brethren come peddle in redemption to your door. And, oh, now don't tell me I'm not going to remember the why. It's different to sing these songs than it is to speak them. Yeah. And they shove that pamphlet in your face, just in case someday you'd maybe want to learn some more. And you blamed last night's whiskey when you told them, boys, I ain't buying what you sell. But when you threw the blessed brethren out, you might have thrown blessing out as well. And you don't know where you came from and you don't know where you'll go. If there's a heaven or a hell, you sure as hell don't know. But if I may share some good advice that's always served me well, from a long-haired rebel teacher who knew someday we'd need his help, he said, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Hey, that's all. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And there's more to that song, but that's the type yeah. of song I'm writing. I'm writing for people who have decided yeah. they don't believe in anything, any kind of higher power at all. And uh, because they have been turned off by the insincerity of uh, some of, uh, you know, other humans. We need um, this song right now. Well, we're we're getting it. We're, right. I, I, we, will, this we is, will definitely continue this this is this is a whole nother one <laughs> well this is this is what i'm working on now it's called for the black sheep oh, so we'll be getting that we'll be getting you a copy of the last wild place anthology and i have another project that's just a four song project but it has a couple of songs on 
um, that I just really had to get out of me. And it's called Scarecrow. So we'll send you those two awesome. for your oh, free truck. What have you got that's still got a CD player in it? Oh, I have a Ford Edge 2008. Come on, Ford Edge. Ford Edge. We were, you know, Leslie and I were nearly killed in Ford Edge. We, it saved we, my life. I had, we, I had a bad accident too, and it saved my life. I'll never have well, anything but. You know what? It saved our lives because we... Uh, we hit a semi. Well, a semi hit us. Oh my God. I'm, I'm <laughs> but so we were that you're okay. <laughs> it well, it was amazing because we weren't moving that fast. We were taking he just cut a corner too short and decided to come in the driver's side of the of the car where Leslie was sitting at the wheel with her eyes about this big around. And the Ford Edge didn't make it, but we did. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. But look at us, we're Ford Edge girls. I know. Woohoo, go Ford. <laughs> Judy, I am enjoying this so very much. I think oh. we probably are about, I think we're probably about out of time because I have this other interview I have to do. Okay, baby. Um, so thank you so I much have... for taking the time. Let's get back together. I want